This lecture is about expository graphs, or graphs that you're likely to share with other people or include in final data analyses. So remember that we use graphs and data analysis both to communicate with ourselves for when we're doing exploratory analysis, but also to communicate with others when we've completed our analysis and we want to describe to other people what we've observed. So expository graphs deal with this fifth case, the case where we're communicating results to other people. So the, the expository graphs have a few characteristics. So again, the goal here is to communicate information. And just like we saw in the exploratory graphs lectures, that information should be communicated as often as possible with position and on common scales and using the principles of graphical data analysis. Another thing to keep in mind is that information density is generally good. So you don't want to make plots that show just one point because otherwise it's not necessary to make a graph. You could just report the data value itself. So the goal is to report graphs that um, explain information that's too hard to explain in words or in text. Here, color and size may both used, be used for communication, but also be used for aesthetics to make the graphs visually pleasing and arresting or for people to want to be able to look at them. And a key point here is that these figures should have understandable and large axes, titles, and legends so that it's easy to communicate the information without people having to sort of look very closely at your plots and try to understand what the variables mean and so forth. So again, we're going to go back to this housing data for this uh, plotting example. And so I've read in the housing data here with this command below. You may need to change the path. And so the first thing that I'm going to talk about is how to change the axes and the axes labels. So um, if I've made this plot, here again I've made a plot of commuting time versus wage. And I've set some of the graphical parameters. If you recall what this plot looked like in the previous lecture, there was actually um, an R expression that appeared here on the axis labels for both X and Y. When you're creating an expository plot, you should never have an R, uh, an R output as the labels of the axes. You should label them with the actual words, in this case, travel time and last 12 month wages. And it's also very important to include the units of measurement. One of the most common uh, sources of difficulty in data analyses or problems with data analyses is when people forget to put the units and there's some kind of plot that makes it very clear that the units are not being considered correctly. Another thing that you can do is you can actually change the size of both the axes and the, uh, the labels. So here I've uh, again made that exact same plot but I've set uh, the label uh, CEX of the labels to be 2. And so you can see there's very large uh, labels of the axes. And then I've set the CEX of the axis to be equal to 1.5, so you see that these values are also larger. So this takes a little fiddling to get just the right uh, size uh, axis labels and the right size axes. In particular, you can see here how in this plot, the uh, extra parenthesis has been cut off and so forth. So it takes a little bit of fiddling, but it's important to get the axis legends to be the right size so that people can uh, actually see your plot and read it carefully. Another thing that you can do is you can actually add a legend to the plot itself. So again, I've made this uh, sort of same plot that I did before um, with uh, now with X and Y labels. And so the other thing that I did is I used the legend command to add a legend. So the legend command takes X and Y values. That's going to be the upper left hand corner of wherever the legend is going to occur. So you can move that around by giving it different X and Y values. Then you can give it the values that you're actually going to describe in sort of the text here. And so in this case, there's only one kind of dot. So I've uh, made the legend just be one character uh, value, which is all surveyed. Then I tell it what color I'm going to label that, um, the size and the sort of the shape of the dot that I'm showing. And so you can see that it gives you the same blue dot here in the legend as you see in the graph. And you get the text that says all surveyed. If you have more than one uh, color, this is particularly useful when you're producing graphs that you're going to share with other people. So it's good to have the graph be standalone so that people don't have to read the figure legend to understand what's going on. In this case, I made a plot again of commuting time versus wage. And then I've colored it by the sex of the individual that is commuting and has a wage. And so in this particular case, I've again put the legend at the x value of 100 and y value of 200,000. And now the legend variable or the legend parameter takes a vector that has two character variables, men and women. So those are going to be the labels of the two points. And then I tell 
uh, the legend uh, function, what are the colors of the two points, in this case black, then red, and then what is the shape, PCH equals 19, and what is the size, 0 0.5, and so I see that the men get labeled with a black dot and the women get lab labeled with a red dot. Again, there's a lot here to do with this legend command that I've sort of skipped over, but this is the basics of how you add a legend to a plot. You also might want to add a title to a plot. This isn't strictly necessary when you're turning in plots for a data analysis, but if you're going to be including plots in, say, a presentation that you're going to be giving to someone, it's always a good idea to have a title for the plot. The title should usually uh, communicate either the type of plot that you're making or the conclusion of the plot. In this case, Wages earned versus commute time just describes what the plot is, but you might also say something like no difference in distribution between men and women of wages versus computing, commuting time. And so uh, all I've done to add this title is just set the main uh, parameter in the plot uh, command to be wages earned versus commuting time. You can also create plots with multiple panels in R. So this is uh, usually done because you want to be able to communicate several components of one analysis all at once. And so it's a good idea to usually make multiple panel plots that are related to each other in some way so that um, people can take a look at different aspects, aspects of the information all in one story. So to do that, what I've done is I've used this par command. The par command allows you to set a lot of different graphical parameters. But the MF row command actually tells you how you can orient a set of graphs um, all on the same figure. So in this case, I've said create a, a graphical uh, device where there's one row and two columns. And so what it's going to do is it's going to fill in the plots as I go um, into each of these slots. So first I make a histogram, and it falls into the first row, first column plot. And then I make a second plot that's a, a scatter plot, and it falls into the second uh, column of this two-panel uh, figure. So what you can do is you can actually create f figures that are even more panels than this. You could make this, say, par mf row equals c3, 5, and that would make a three-row by five-column set of plots. So you can make these sort of bigger and bigger and bigger. But ideally, you won't make multiple panel plots much above um, four, two by two because they start to be sort of hard to see. You can also add text either to the margins or to the uh, plots themselves. So in this case, again, I've created a two panel plot. And now I wanted to label it with the, a letter for each panel. So in this case, it's A for this panel and B for this panel. And I do that with the mText command. So the mText puts text in the margins of a figure. And so what I've done here is I say mText, and then I give it the actual text I want it to print out, and I tell it the side. In this, if you look at the help file for mText, it tells you which number corresponds to which side. Three corresponds to the top of the plot. And then I tell it how far I want it to be away from the, the top edge of the plot by giving it a different line. So in this case, I say I want it to be one line above the top of the plot. And then I do a similar thing for the scatter plot and B here below. So now I have a figure where I can refer to the first panel as panel A and the second panel as panel B. Another important component of expository graphics is including figure captions. So this seems a little bit pedantic, but it's pretty critical for communicating data well. So when you're creating a figure, uh, you create, say in this case, this two panel figure that I did before. You're going to uh, label your figure with the number, but you're also going to usually um, add a bolded text which describes um, what the whole purpose of the entire plot is. So in this case, distribution of compute, commute time and relationship to wage earned by sex it sort of communicates what this entire plot is all about. And then for each subcomponent of the graph, A and B, you actually describe what you see in the graph. Figure captions should be um, self-contained enough that persons shouldn't have to look through the text of your data analysis to understand what the point of this particular figure is and what you're trying to communicate. This is a key and often overlooked component of creating figures for data analyses. So another important component of creating figures is paying attention to your audience. And so uh, one thing that is very useful is to be able to determine if your plots are um, visible to people with color blindness. So sometimes when you pick your colors, in particular if you choose, say, red and green um, for the colors of different uh, values in your graph, it will be very hard for people with color blindness to see. 
I've linked here to a website, VizCheck, that allows you to upload your graphs and it will kind of show you what it would look like to somebody with colorblindness. So you can evaluate whether your graphs will be hard to see by people with colorblindness. So the graphical workflow starts with a rough plot. We saw that in exploratory uh, graphics, and then we tweak it to make it expository. That We've sort of talked about tweaking figure legends and axes and so forth. Then the next step is to save the file, so you can include it in presentations or in data analyses. So saving files in R is done with graphics devices. Uh, to see all of the devices that you have access to, you can type question mark, capital, device, D devices. And so we're going to cover a few of the most popular ones here. So the first is uh, how to create a PDF. So if I want to save that two panel plot I've been making uh, in previous slides as a PDF file, I use the PDF device. So what I do is I type the command PDF and then I tell it where, which file, what's the PDF file I want the graph to be saved to. Then I tell it the height and width of the PDF. So in the case of a two panel plot, I need the height to be half the size of the width. So in this case I make the height to be four and the width to be eight. These numbers are given in inches, so um, if you want to make the figure bigger or smaller, when you change the numbers, you're changing them in inches. Then I just run all the commands that I would have run anyway to create the plot, and then I tell R that I'm done using that device and it should close it off and save the file, and I do that by typing dev.off, open parentheses, close parentheses, and I'll get something like this where it tells me that it's closed a PDF device and it was the second device I had open. So you can look um, and see that the P what you've done then, if you've run these commands, is created a PDF called twopanel.pdf, and it will, if all these commands were run correctly, it will have created a figure that looks like that two-panel plot we showed a minute ago. You can also do the same thing and create a PNG file instead of a PDF file. It's a similar sort of uh, behavior in that you uh, type PNG and tell it which file you want to save to. The height now is in pixels, so it's in. So here I'm using 480, which is the default and I have double the width so that because it's a two panel plot. Then I run the exact same commands and I turn off the device again so that I get a, um, a, a PNG file now that has the same plot. Another thing that you can do is, so, so when you do either of the PNG or P, PDF or really any of the other devices, it's going to save the graph um, with a very specific set of characteristics. And sometimes when you make that um, plot, you'll see that it didn't turn out quite how you liked because you set the height or the width of the graph just slightly too wrong, uh, incorrectly. So one thing that you can do is you can actually tweak uh, the graph interactively. So you can sort of make, just use the commands that you would normally use to make any kind of graphic that you would want to be able to make. And then once you have the graph just where it right and you want the exact graph you see on the screen to be saved as a PDF file, you can type dev.copy to PDF and give it a file name and what it'll do then is it'll take the exact picture that you have on the screen and save it to a PDF. And that way you don't have to sort of have troubles with the size of the figure being sort of difficult to manage. Once you've created enough PDF and PNG files in R, you'll start to thank uh, dev.copy to PDF uh, because it makes a lot of sort of figure creation a little bit easier. So that's a little bit more about creating graphs. Now a couple of uh, interesting side notes to end with. So first of all is there's this sort of interesting list of graphs, the top 10 worst graphs, um, and it's available from here, this website here. One of your goals should be when creating expository graphs not to end up on this site. Um, a couple of things that uh, will surely uh, put you at risk for landing on the worst graph site are communicating way too much information in a plot, communicating way too little information in a plot, like only one point, using 3D graphics when it's unnecessary because it can be confusing, so for example 3D box plots and so forth, or um, uh, not explaining your graphs well. So all of those things should you, you know now after having seen these videos not to do and hopefully you'll never end up on this uh, list of top 10 worst graphs. Um, and then there's, here's something, uh, on the other hand, a positive thing to aspire to. This is a graph um, that shows connections between Facebook users. And this is the uh, blog post describing how it was actually created. It turns out this graph was created entirely using R. So it's pretty spectacular how beautiful the, the graphics that you can make with R if you sort of take the time to learn all of the different parameters and how they work. So that's something that um, you can aspire to as you're creating R graphics. So here's some few further resources that might be useful for you. So um, 
This is a uh, uh, how to display data badly is a, a paper on uh, some some of the no nos for when you're creating graphics. Uh, the visual display of quantitative information um, and creating more effective graphs are both sort of books that might be useful for you, as is the R Graphics Cookbook, which is actually a very recent book that came out that shows you how to make a whole bunch of different kinds of graphs. Then there's a, a book on ggplot2. ggplot and ggplot2 are an entirely different graphics framework than we've covered here, but are incredibly useful for making very uh, slick looking graphs. Um, and this book explains a lot about that. And then flowing data, which shows uh, a lot of examples like that Facebook example of uh, very cool graphics that are made both in R and uh, with other software that can inspire you on uh, different ways that you might think about displaying data in your next data analysis report.